What was the decision like for you? Because we've never had that conversation. I'm I'm curious because I have this recollection that you were far out ahead of that reporting that LeBron was going to Miami. And from my recollection, there was just so much pressure on that and what it was going to be. And I think, I mean, were you part, I mean, this is poor research done by me. You might've even been part of the decision special. Do, do I have that right? Um, I, yes. I was not, I was not part of their special, but mm. as you know, like you said, I was doing around the clock reporting on that. Yeah. And so that was, that was a great time to be honest. I, I, re, I think back with fondness to that time. So it was 2010, of course. And as you know, that was the story of the decade or at that even the century at yeah. that point because it was early in the 2000s. <laughs> and since then, almost every summer has had, you know, big time free agents that everybody followed. But at that point, this was it wasn't a first, but yeah. the magnitude of it had not been seen before. And so my thinking was, man, this is really a chance to separate myself. And so I was working around the clock for those three weeks or so. Uh, I was just working around the clock. And and it even got to the point where ESPN, because I was getting good information, was having me on almost all day. Like I would go in, there were days, many days, where I would go in to be on Mike and Mike in the morning in the 6 o'clock a.m. hour. And I would be at the studio in Bristol until like midnight. You know, because they will want me on the evening sports center and then the, the afternoon sports center and, and ESPN News and all of that. And so that really did help my career as well, because I was getting a lot of news. And then they put me on the NBA countdown show with Magic Johnson, uh, John Barry and Michael Wilbon. And that was big. We, we were out in L.A. Uh, so that did help my career a lot. Now, the interesting thing is I once I did, you know, well covering that story, I felt like it wasn't spoken, but I felt like ESPN started looking at me like, oh, this guy's going to be our Adam Schefter of the mm. NBA. And I never wanted to be that. You no. know, I, I worked around the clock for those three weeks but I didn't want to work around the clock for 350 days a year. Yeah. Real yeah. talk. And so they kind of viewed me in that role. I never said anything like, hey, I don't want to do that. So I just kind of let it flow. And then, you know, they started looking at me to break all these stories. And I, I really wasn't to be I was working and I was putting in my work, but I wasn't working like a Woj or a Shams around the yeah. clock all day, every day. And I, subsequently, I wasn't breaking news like they were. Yeah, I mean, that lifestyle is impossible. Oh. And I remember what the ESPN news desk was like, Chris, and I wasn't even a newsbreaker. But if there was some news from a practice with the Warriors, they were angry at me that I didn't do what they wanted to do. Right. And it's a pressure. I mean, there's a Washington Post article from about two years ago on Schefter and how he lives his life. And yeah, he gets paid nine million dollars a year but i came away from it going that is not worth it that's right. not worth it people might think it's worth it i mean there are probably people listening who have a job that they absolutely hate who go yeah i would want to be on tv and famous and breaking stories but when you actually read about Schefter's life that's a mental prison man he is in a state of forever vigilance and fear and consumption and it's just one of these things where I I kind of wonder two things. One, why do we need this this much? And number two, it's just, uh, I just, the second thing is just, I, I don't, I'm not sure. How do you feel about the elevation of the newsbreak to this degree where it just bleeds out somebody when they're, uh, when, when they're that big time with it? Yeah. I mean, first of all, like you said, I agree that I, I just didn't want that lifestyle. Um, I, I got two daughters. Uh, I'm married <laughs> and I really wanted to have, you know, of course, work and work hard, but yeah. have family time as well. I remember after that summer of 2010, after the decision and, and all that, 
I went on vacation with my family, my daughters and my wife, and we were at amusement parks and just, you know, out having a good time. And I was getting, I always had been in touch with guys around the league, but now a lot of people were calling me and giving Mm -hmm. me information or wanting to give me information. And I was like, I'm on vacation. I'm not trying Mm -hmm. to break a story necessarily right now, you know, and it's hard to say that because these are sources and you don't want to tell them don't call or, you know what I mean? You, you kind of need yeah. to break the news as they're it's giving addictive. it. To you. But it was, I was just like, I can't, I'm not trying to do this. Um, my life is about more than just being a sports writer and my family comes before my career. They're intertwined obviously, but um, so To your question about the newsbreaker now, it it really shifted with Twitter. Um, And I give Woj and Schefter a lot of credit for how they capitalized on it. You know, I used to feel like when you broke a story, you had to have the the substance of it, the why, the what happened, Mm. what why was this decision made, so on and so forth. And then with Twitter, it just became the transactional. You know, like this is the transaction that's happening. And you know how it is, Ethan. It really, who got it first was dependent. A lot of this comes from agents. And yeah. an agent might text you first and then 30 seconds later text the next guy and then the yeah. next guy. And it's really whoever gets it out first. I mean, you have that advantage if you were the first one. I miss stories. There were times where I might have fallen asleep and it's 2 a.m. I remember one time specifically, it was a big story about a coaching hire and I had kind of been out in front of it and working with it, you know, getting the info from this agent. He texted me first, but I fall, I was asleep and I got a text at like 2.30 in the morning. I woke up around 3, 3.30 and saw the news broke and I, checked to see if the agent had hit me and he had before it broke, but I was asleep and didn't (laughs) end up breaking the story. And so um, it's just like you said, now it's just a a lot of transactions. And one thing you do see is sometimes you can see like, again, I did not want to, you have to develop relationships and trust with people that could become sources But again, I also always felt like I do need to remain objective and I can't just do somebody's bidding to get certain stories, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. And so that that could hurt you in in this type of news breaking business or an atmosphere the way it is now. So I'm glad glad to be out of it. Believe me. (laughs) <laughs> oh, dude, I think you, I, I, I don't know if it's that you made the right decision or you just had the right values, but it led you to a better place to be on TV, which is funny because for a lot of people, television can be mentally deranging in of itself. A lot of people psychologically can't handle television. I get the sense with you and Nick and Wilds that for whatever reason, you guys can do it in a way that's healthy, but I think that speaks in a way to how horrible being a top newsbreaker is that it's better to be on tv it's more psychologically healthy to have the pratfalls of narcissism and being on television than it is to constantly have to worry that at 2 30 a.m you're going to get a text that you should have gotten and then you're going to fail look one thing i love now and this has been the case since i went to fox in 2016 i work monday through friday And then when I'm not on the air, I'm done. I mean, obviously, Mm -hmm. I'm keeping track of what's going on around the sports and watching the games and stuff. But I don't have to, like, worry about getting this call from this agent or making calls myself over the weekend. I still talk to people around the league to have an educated opinion. But it it really is like you have full days off where you can be with your family, Mm -hmm. where you can do what you you want to do. So it is much healthier in that respect. It's I, I tell people all the time, it's like I've gone from being like in the old newspaper days, a beat writer to a columnist. I'm just doing it on television and radio. So I used to be a beat writer on television when you're an insider. And now I'm like a columnist on television. 
and I can just share my opinion. So now with free agency in the NBA about to heat up, I don't have to chase where Paul George is going, who Philadelphia is going to get. I can just react to it, have an, I have a take on it, and then talk about it in that regard, which is much better and much healthier. And I, I think you probably can I don't know if you have more impact, but it's certainly much uh, much healthier, at least well, in my in my regard. Well, you can talk more about the stuff fans care about. I think that's where the transaction has gotten a little far afield, where we're just getting so into the information and not the context right. around which people actually enjoy it.